Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to 4-1. So now we're talking about the sensory systems of the spinal cord. So just like in the motor system, we have a multi-neuron chain. We had an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. In the sensory chain, we're going to have uh, three neurons from the periphery to the cortex. So all of these systems are going to have uh, an additional neuron somewhere in that chain. But to begin talking about this, I want to talk about the most peripheral aspect of the sensory chain first, and those are the sensory receptors. Sensory receptors are located uh, throughout the periphery of the body. Most of them that we're going to talk about are we're going to talk about in the skin, and that's kind of the analogy for the rest of these uh, sensory receptors as well. So uh, we'll keep on moving. Uh, so we've talked about the white matter tracks. Uh, so here we're going to shade them in again. So uh, recalling this information from last time is a primer for what we're talking about this time. So these white matter tracts are part of the central process uh, of the uh, dorsal gray matter neurons, that, which are the sensory neurons. So this is one step removed from the sensory receptors. The sensory receptors are located, uh, as I said, in the periphery of the body, and these are very specialized uh, neuronal processes or cells located throughout uh, the, the periphery and the musculoskeletal system. These detect and respond to different types of stimuli, uh, and we'll talk about each different type of stimulation when we talk about the, uh, the uh, classifications of these sensory receptors. So these sensory receptors are part of that peripheral process of the dorsal root ganglion. So remember the dorsal root ganglion has a peripheral process that might go to the skin or some other structure and a central process that synapses in the dorsal gray matter of the spinal cord. So what we're talking about today is just that peripheral process, nothing else. So here are the five main different classifications of these uh, sensory receptors. You have mechanoreceptors, nociceptors, thermoreceptors, photoreceptors, and chemoreceptors. Uh, but first, before we get into those individual classifications, let's talk about some of the traits that all of these uh, sensory receptors have. The first one is the concept of the receptive field. So a receptive field is the area in which one peripheral process can detect something. Uh, so for instance, if one peripheral process of that one neuron detect is arborizing on a large portion of the skin, then you have less ability, less resolution to detect multiple points within that region. So if something uh, sent or impacts that sensory receptor anywhere within that receptive field, it activates that one neuron uh, and sends the signal that something's touching that area. So the smaller a receptive field area is, the more refined the sense can be in that area. So here you can think about it in terms of two-point discrimination. So here we have a uh, uh, compass here, a two-point uh, sensor, and we're showing that this one axon is arborizing across this entire area of skin. So this, these two points are touching the skin within that one area simultaneously, but the patient or the individual will only say that they feel one uh, point because they can't detect between the two points. Just this one axon is firing. <clears throat> Here in the case where we have a smaller receptive field uh, governed by multiple different axons, uh, the same two-point mechanism, the patient will be able to discriminate between those two points because the receptive field is so much smaller. Uh, so the receptive field for our sensory reception on our skin uh, varies across our entire body. Uh, it's, it's very small within our face, so we can detect two points very easily on our face, on our back, uh, some unimportant parts of our arms. The receptive fields get larger 
So for instance, uh, it, you know, you can test this out on uh, somebody that uh, you know you're um, you're living with or or whatever a subject um, that's readily available, and just get you know two uh, points, pencils, whatever, at a certain distance apart. Touch their back, see if they can detect it's one or two points. Then touch you know the underside of their arm or the palm of their skin or portions of their face. You know, have them close their eyes and then report. Have them report whether they detect one or two points. And so that forms the basis of a neurological exam for, uh, for touch sensation and, and dermatome testing. <clears throat> so you can think of this analogy in terms of resolution of a computer monitor or an HDTV. The smaller the pixel, the higher the resolution is. So the pixel size is the receptive field area. So on the right, you have very small receptive fields. You have very small pixels, so you get a high resolution in that area. On the left, larger pixels, less resolution. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, well not finally, but the next trait is, that we're gonna talk about is adaptability. So these sensory receptors adapt to a stimulus over time. Some adapt quickly, some adapt very slowly. So neurons that adapt very slowly, uh, a person will be able to detect a stimulus uh, for a longer period of time. But if a sensory receptor adapts rapidly, then uh, they may uh, detect that they feel something and then the sense of that thing touching them goes away. So depending on the sensory receptor, um, it can adapt at different rates. And so I have a picture down here of hair follicles, skin, uh, hair on the skin. And that's because we have hair all over our bodies, uh, some more than others. Uh, and so as you brush your finger across this hair, you can feel the hairs move, but uh, if the hair, you don't feel the constant directionality of every hair on your body. That's because the sensory receptors around the hair follicles are rapidly adapting. So you need to know if something brushes up against your skin and your hair, but you don't need to know the position of every hair follicle on your body at every time. That would result in sensory overload. Also, uh, our clothes on our body, if our uh, hair follicle receptors were slowly adapting, then our their, the clothes brushing up against our hairy bodies uh, would be you know, extremely irritating and annoying because we would constantly be feeling that sensation of the clothes on our body. Uh, so that's an example of adaptability. And now, encapsulation versus non-encapsulation. Uh, this refers to whether the nerve ending of that peripheral process has another structure around it, enclosing it or encapsulating it. Some, uh, some sensory receptors do, and these encapsulated endings provide uh, special uh, functionality to detect certain types of sensation. Uh, some don't have an encapsulation, and they're just free nerve endings. And so uh, that can, that nerve covering uh, can determine the type of uh, functionality of that sensory receptor. And so here again, we have those five different classifications. First, we'll talk about different types of uh, mechanoreceptors, especially in the skin, cutaneous mechanoreceptors. So these, uh, f these nerve endings, uh, these sensory receptors are located throughout the dermis, epidermis, and deeper into the superficial fascia, and they all respond to mechanical deformation. So all neurons have ion channels within them, and all of these ion channels open and close based on a conformational change. Sometimes that conformational change happens due to the binding of a receptor molecule or due to a change in the ionic gradient across the membrane. In mechanoreceptors, these ion channels open and close mechanically, as the free nerve ending bends and moves, that ion channel will open or close. And that opening and closing can result in a local membrane potential uh, if, if the mechanical deformation is not strong enough to uh, result in the stronger action potential. The action potential, once a neuron is bent uh, to a large enough degree, uh, it will open enough ion channels to cause an action potential, and that will result in sensation 
received in the spinal cord. So here is a drawing of different uh, portions of the skin and the sensory receptors, the different sensory receptors in the skin, and we'll go through them one by one. First, we'll talk about free nerve endings. Free nerve endings can be found around hair follicles and also within the dermis and epidermis of the skin. So these uh, free nerve endings, uh, basically, you know, their name, non-encapsulated, and we already talked about those around hair follicles. Uh, so these are all rapidly adapting. Uh, so um, you get the point. So let's move on quickly through these and you can review them on your own. Merkel discs are located at the interface of the epidermis and dermis. These are encapsulated by a cell known as the Merkel cell. So uh, when the Merkel cell is mechanically deformed, somebody's pressing on the skin, it deforms this Merkel cell. Merkel cell releases neurotransmitter into the synapse, uh, and that results in the action potential uh, of this sensory receptor. So these are slowly adapting, so they, for, they serve a different purpose uh, in sensing uh, deformation of the skin. Next we have Meissner corpuscles. Uh, these are probably my favorite. Meissner corpuscles are encapsulated by a um, uh, kind of like a Schwann cell type structure, a myelinated structure. And so this nerve ending coils right in the uh, dermis of the skin, right at the interface with the epidermis. And so coiled within this Schwann cell uh, forms a spring type uh, shape to the end of this sensory receptor. Uh, so that spring-like shape is perpendicular to the surface of the skin, so it can detect uh, a very fine grain uh, sensation in deformation of the skin. So these are rapidly adapting, and they're very sensitive. So they respond to light touch. These you'll find uh, in parts of your body that are very sensitive, the palms of your hand and your fingertips, your nose, your lips, uh, your genitalia, uh, the soles of your feet. Uh, so those are responsible for that really fine sense that you get in your face, where your face can, you know, you can tickle, uh, ticklish areas, that sort of stuff. Next, moving deeper, uh, we'll find Pacinian corpuscles. Pacinian corpuscles look like onions. They have this layered encapsulation. It gets finer and finer. Uh, and these respond to deep pressure as well as vibration. Uh, so when you feel... Uh, you know, the, the dinosaur uh, approaching your Jeep, uh, that the Pacinian corpuscle is detecting that vibration, that very deep sound wave. Uh, and so these are rapidly adapting, uh, but because they're deeper in the skin, it needs a stronger uh, sense. Now we also have Ruffini endings. Uh, these respond to stretching of the uh, superficial fascia. Uh, so if you ever uh, knew like one of those asshole kids in, in uh, elementary school that would run up and twist your skin like that and you'd get that burning sensation, uh, or if you happen to be that kid, um, this is the sensory receptor uh, that results in that sense of that stretching, that deep burning stretching. So slowly adapting, so you know that kid came up and twisted your your arm like that, and it burned for like a few minutes. You felt that for a few minutes. That's because it was slowly adapting. <clears throat> so we also have mechanoreceptors uh, associated with the muscles and joints. So the joint receptors uh, are analogous to the Pacinian corpuscle and the Ruffini ending. They're just located within the cartilage and within uh, the structures of the joints. The muscle receptors are particularly interesting because they're specialized structures, muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. Muscle spindles are located embedded within the muscle bellies. Golgi tendon organs are located within the tendon, attaching the muscle bellies to the bone. And so they have different structures. Uh, the uh, the uh, muscle spindle is encapsulated by this connective tissue covering. Uh, let me see how many slides I have. Yeah, so uh, within that uh, muscle spindle, there are mul multiple different types of intrafusal fibers. So intrafusal, because they're within 
that fused uh, connective tissue. Extrafusal fibers are the skeletal muscles you typically think about. <clears throat> so these nuclear bag fibers have a, a particular shape to them, a rounded shape. Nuclear chain fibers are, are thinner and look more like extrafusal fibers. <clears throat> so these um, intrafusal fibers respond to a change in the length of the muscle. And so they help you regulate automatically the, uh, the contraction of your muscle. The nuclear bag fibers are primarily innervated by annulospiral endings, also called 1A uh, sensory receptor fibers. Remember that table I showed you about the different types of axons uh, within a nerve and it had the different speeds and myelination amounts. So that, uh, these classifications, 1A and 2, you can refer to that table if you wish. Uh, so these annulospiral endings are spring-like, so they are detecting uh, the rapid changes in the muscle length of these bag fibers. The flower spray endings, classified as two, uh, two fibers, are located primarily on the chain fibers, um, <clears throat> the nuclear chain fibers, and as they span out, they will detect the static stretch of the uh, nuclear chain fiber. So not so much the active change, but the static change, how far apart are these points spread. And so in this way, these two sensory fibers, you get that rate of change and you get the static stretch of the muscle. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> what happens is that as those uh, muscle fibers in the uh, muscle spindle change in shape. They send that information into the spinal cord. And uh, so say that um, your muscle is becoming slack. They send that slackening information up uh, and output to the, uh, the um, extrafusal portion of the intrafusal fibers here, output to this uh, portion outside the connective tissue are called gamma fibers, and those will change the uh, length of the nuclear bag and nuclear chain fibers to reset them. So say you have, um, say you have stretched a muscle out to its fullest extent, uh, the uh, annulospiral endings have detected the velocity of that change, the flower spray endings detect how long it is, and now to go back to a baseline to recalibrate those neurons, uh, these gamma efferent fibers are going to stretch uh, or, or contract uh, and reset the uh, stretch of those nuclear bag and nuclear chain fibers so they can detect within their optimal range again. <clears throat> um, so, um, so these muscle uh, spindles are part of what's called the stretch reflex or the muscle spindle reflex, uh, part of the anti-gravity reflex. So <clears throat> if you are holding your arm out uh, at a certain angle and something lands in your arm like a ball or a water bottle, your uh, muscle will stretch and then automatically come back up. That's an automatic response. So, boom, and it comes back up, boom. I'm afraid I'm gonna drop it. So, as those muscles come back up, that is the muscle spindle reflex. The muscle spindle is detecting that lengthening of the, of the muscle as something lands in it. Uh, and it's sending that information to the spinal cord uh, to uh, activate the efferent muscle fibers uh, to cause them to uh, uh, contract. So now let's take a look at the, uh, for some reason it just exited out of my slide here, uh, but anyway, going back to this, so now let's move on to the Golgi tendon organs. Golgi tendon organs have this uh, neuron uh, ending intertwined, arborizing within the collagen fibers of the, um, the tendon of the muscle. Not in the muscle belly, but at the end in the tendon. 
And so these are kind of like free nerve endings, but they're just arborizing within the uh, collagen fibers instead of the epidermis. <clears throat> and so in this way, these Golgi tendon organ and this nerve ending within the collagen is going to detect, detect the stress, the strain on a tendon of a muscle. So this results in the uh, what's called the Golgi tendon reflex or the overstretch reflex. So say a weightlifter is lifting something up as strong as they can, as hard as they can, is really heavy weight, and it gets so heavy that, that uh, they can't lift it up anymore, and they'll just, their muscle will automatically release it and drop. So what's happening here is that uh, the Golgi tendon organ is detecting a dangerous strain on the tendon. And as a result, its safety mechanism is to inhibit the action of the muscle attached to that tendon. So it will send that information back to the spinal cord, uh, to those inhibitory inner neurons, and cause those uh, inhibitory neurons to cease firing of the lower motor neuron, causing the flaccidity in that muscle, the automatic flaccidity of that muscle. So again, briefly, joint receptors, uh, piscinian corpuscle, and Raffini ending type structures, but located within the joint capsules. So that'll detect, um, you know, inflammation, edema, uh, things like that, uh, overstretching within a joint. <clears throat> so there are other type of mechanoreceptors elsewhere in the body. Uh, mechanoreceptors in the auditory and vestibular system. These are called hair cells. And these hair cells have cilia, uh, which project up uh, off the bottom of the hair cell. And as your body moves or as sound waves move through a fluid, these uh, cilia are located within that fluid and they, ch they are mechanically moved. And that change in conformation uh, results in the opening of ion channels and the sending of an action potential uh, through the hair cell uh, into the afferent ascending neuron. <clears throat> so that's mechanoreceptors. So now let's talk about nociceptors and thermoreceptors. Uh, so these are uh, basically free nerve endings located in the epidermis. And they will respond to different types of signals. They'll respond to changes in temperature or um, uh, noxious stretching or to some, um, in some cases, even some uh, inflammatory factors and uh, things like that. So these nociceptors and thermoreceptors send that information uh, via this free nerve ending. And they uh, tend to adapt very slowly or not at all. So thermoreceptors, think about this. You walk into a cold classroom and you feel cold, your skin gets very cold and you sit in that classroom and you're, st you're cold for like 10 or 15 minutes. And then, uh, you know, suddenly you realize that you feel like you've warmed up. Well, that's because these thermoreceptors have adapted slowly over time, but they have adapted. So eventually uh, you stop feeling that sense of coldness and you, you know, become adjusted to the temperature in the room. Nociceptors uh, never adapt. So uh, if you're feeling pain, you always need to know that that noxious stimulus is nearby so that you can respond to it. Photoreceptors, the rods and the cones in the eye, actually uh, respond to uh, photons of light. There are very specific uh, enzymes within uh, the rods and cones which respond to certain wavelengths of light. These uh, enzymes change their conformation when they receive the energy of the momentum of the photon of light, resulting in eventually a cascade that leads to the firing of uh, these neurons in an action potential. Chemoreceptors. This is kind of what we think about when we think about um, you know, any type of uh, neuron. We think about some chemical binding to a receptor causing an action potential. And so chemoreceptors are found throughout the body in the olfactory system that gives you your sense of smell on your taste buds is a very uh, typical example. But also inside your endothelium, in your blood system, there are chemoreceptors in your neck, in the carotid body at the bifurcation of the, uh, the uh, carotid artery. 
and that chemoreceptor detects things like the pH of your blood and the uh, carbon dioxide content of your blood and it will um, autonomically stimulate an increase or decrease in respiration to compensate uh, for uh, uh, an excess of carbon dioxide, for instance. So chemoreceptors are important throughout multiple systems. <clears throat> so here's an example of a chemoreceptor, the taste bud. Uh, this taste bud structure is also uh, the same or, or very similar within the carotid body. And so later on in the course, we'll talk about these different cranial nerves and we'll define them in more detail. But just know that they're coming up uh, you know, just know that the chemoreceptor is part of taste on your tongue and the carotid body um, in your, uh, in your, uh, the bifurcation of your carotid artery. And then uh, chemoreceptors in the olfactory uh, epithelium. So these chemoreceptors here in the epithelium are detecting any substance that enters your nasal cavity and your respiratory tract and signaling that it's detected certain uh, types of uh, chemical signatures. So there are very specific chemoreceptors within the olfactory epithelium that detect all of these different smells and allow you to identify them based on, you know, the mixtures of different types of odorants and, and whatnot. So if you think about it, you know, um, say you're like uh, in your grandmother's house and you smell the apple pie as you enter and so, those molecules of the apple pie are floating through the air in the house and impacting your um, olfactory epithelium. Or say you're in a public restroom and the guy next to you or the gal next to you in the stall is really blowing it out their ass uh, and that smell just permeates the whole restroom. Well, that's because uh, small molecules of uh, what's coming out of their rear end is floating through the air and coming into your respiratory tract, into your nose. Uh, so uh, I hope I ruined public restrooms for you, but that's, that's the facts. <clears throat> so these different types of uh, sensory receptors give us all of our important senses that allow us to determine what's going on in our, uh, in our environment around us and ultimately to respond to that. So uh, here's a bunny rabbit you know, with a uh, pancake on its head. So its hair receptors and pressure sensors, sending corpuscles and whatnot are detecting that hair. So um, we also have pressure sensation in our, um, in our bodies that help us to constantly adjust our posture so that pressure doesn't build up on a certain region of our body. <clears throat> so this is particularly important for uh, individuals in wheelchairs because um, uh, paraplegics, quadriplegics, whatnot, cannot necessarily detect pressure in their bodies. And so pressure builds up on their ischial tuberosity, uh, which can result in uh, what's called a dicubitus or a decubitus ulcer. Decubitus ulcer is when pressure uh, builds up so much that the bone actually projects through and tears through the skin. Uh, so normally we're always constantly shifting in our chairs, moving about, relieving that pressure, um, but individuals that lack that pressure sensation uh, don't do that. And so bedridden patients, patients in wheelchairs, need to be moved around constantly in order to prevent decubitus ulcers from occurring. <clears throat> The Golgi tendon uh, and the muscle spindle receptors uh, help us protect our muscles and help us maintain uh, the strength and tone of our muscles. So here, this individual, um, uh, unfortunately, the muscle tendon reflex was overcome. So some weightlifters, for instance, um, their weight capacity increases with the building up of muscle fibers in their body. But some of that training also comes from um, overcoming the automatic Golgi tendon reflex so that they can move, bring their muscles to that envelope, to that just, just at the edge um, more frequently. And in some cases, uh, they go over the edge. And so this can result in rupturing of the tendon. And so here, this is called the, um, the um, a Popeye sign after Popeye the sailor man. This person uh, ruptured their tendon 
um, probably because that Golgi tendon reflex didn't occur, uh, resulting in detached uh, biceps brachii. So this requires surgical reattachment uh, and whatnot. <clears throat> So nociception is important because it allows us to sense pain. If we don't have nociceptors, then we don't uh, remove ourselves from noxious pain. Uh, and so this little girl, uh, I believe her name was Gabby, uh, she was born with a congenital insensitivity to pain due to a, a genetic defect in her nociceptors. Uh, so uh, you know, she... Uh, doesn't sense pain and you think this is good but it's actually quite bad because she doesn't know she doesn't get the sense of pain when she keeps digging at her face or her eyes that's why she has goggles over her eyes to prevent her from digging into her orbit um, at one point uh, she just kept chewing on her fingers to the point where uh, she uh, you know has has caused significant damage to her fingers or she'll keep scratching at a scab to open the scab uh, so uh, nociceptors are very important, although they can be annoying and uh, annoying in day-to-day -day life. They're quite important. And again, thermal sensation helps us avoid noxious thermal situations. Here's a full thickness burn on the back of this individual's hand. Here, this is the result of uh, frostbite um, from an individual climbing on uh, the Himalayan mountains. Um, so you can see... Um, the result of that and it's actually uh, interesting is that um, these types of pain damage these this damage is cumulative over time so if you get mild frostbite once you're more prone to get frostbite again and again so um, exposure to these environments weakens the the uh, skin and weakens the capillaries on a permanent basis so prevention is very important in those types of things. Photoreceptors. So if you don't have photoreceptors, uh, you're, um, you know, you have that as an impairment. Here I'm showing you examples of how to overcome that. Braille. Uh, uh, you know, Ray Charles playing the piano. Um, so some people compensate with a lack of one sense by uh, increasing the fidelity of other senses. So there's uh, photoreceptive regions of the brain, the occipital cortex, can be used uh, for other modalities if necessary. Photoreceptors also ha help regulate our sleep patterns. Uh, so the, uh, there are blue light sensors within the retina of the eye uh, that, when activated, inhibit the form formation of melatonin in the brain. And so whenever uh, light is present, it is inhibiting you from, from sleeping. So uh, that's why it's said to limit screen time later in the day uh, so that you can get good sleep. And then chemoreceptors. So chemoreceptors help us in a number of ways. They help us uh, detect toxins in the form of bitter uh, poisonous plants like um, uh, hemlock here uh, on the left. Um, we also have a um, Brutus the Buckeye. Buckeyes are, in fact, poisonous. Do not eat a Buckeye. Uh, so, uh, you know, Ohio State fans, stay away from them. Um, the uh, gas grill here, so we actually add uh, chemicals to the methane used in gas grills because methane we can't detect. It doesn't have an odor. Uh, so we add... Um, uh, mercaptoethanol so, or, or sometimes a sulfur compound, I'm not quite sure, to the gas line so that we can uh, be aware of gas leaks. Here on the upper right, uh, we have an example of a car wreck. And what's important to know about this is that the uh, sensory receptors in the olfactory epithelium uh, are very thin and in a frontal collision, the movement of the brain within the cranial cavity can sever those olfactory neurons. So a common symptom after high-speed uh, car wrecks is anosmia, a lack of sense of smell. And the sense of smell is so closely related to the limbic functions of the brain that this can lead to um, uh, yeah, major depression, clinical uh, depression, as the limbic system doesn't get activated as regularly. So here in the bottom right, I have an example of uh, a surgeon or a nurse wearing a mask. 
so this is an example of, uh, I'm using this as an example of the carbon dioxide buildup uh, that surgeons uh, face over prolonged wearing of the mask. Uh, and that's because the carbon dioxide, uh, the exhaling of the air isn't as free through the mask that uh, results in a higher concentration of carbon dioxide that you breathe in. And eventually over hours and uh, you know prolonged surgeries, uh, that carbon dioxide will build up in the blood and be detected by the uh, carotid body, the chemoreceptors in the carotid body. So anyway, that's it for sensory receptors. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'll uh, see you next time.